Hello and welcome to this Livewire thematic discussion. I'm joined by Dr. Shane Oliver, Head of Investment Strategy at AMP Capital, and David Bassanese, Chief Economist at BetaShares. Gentlemen, thank you for joining us. Pleasure, James. We'd normally have a couple of stock pickers on the show to talk us through a thematic discussion, but today we've gone for some guys that really know what's going on in the broader macro environment. Uh, Shane, we're on the eve of the, uh, the meeting of the, the FOMC uh, decision, I should say, about US rates. I'm not going to put you on the spot on that front, but in terms of the key, um, I, I guess, the factors that, that Janet Yellen and her committee will be thinking about right now, what do you think is, is front and centre in her mind? Well, I think it's a real, real balancing act for the Fed because on the one hand, the labour market in the US has clearly picked up. So they've got the US economy where they want it to be. What's missing though is the inflation side. So that's why this decision has been such a close call um, for ec economists, for the market, um, difficult to work out. And, and I guess investors are also thinking, well, if you, we've had six years now of rates being near zero, last hike uh, back in 2006. Um, we also know back in uh, 2004 when they first started to move rates after the low period in the early part of the last decade, there was a bit of a wobble in shares then, likewise in 1994. So it's quite common to go through this nervousness at the time of the first hike. At the end of the day though, it may not matter as much as investors seem to think because I think the Fed's not going to do anything um, that threatens the global recovery. It's going to be a very gradual process when they do move. Um, and when they do move, they're going to say, well, this isn't like 1994, don't expect one hike after another. So at the end of the day, um, I don't think it's as big an issue as many investors are fretting about. You touched on the point there about inflation, and that's probably the one thing that people keep raising is, you know, where is it, where's it going to come from? Uh, what do you think could be contributing to the, the fact that inflation is so benign? Well, this is the big issue here, and it's the inflation side of the ledger that says, well, the Fed should be pretty cautious here. And um, the problem there in America is that their preferred measure of inflation is down at 1.2 per cent. Um, that's the core private consumption deflator. And likewise, when you look around globally, you've got falling and weak commodity prices. We've got lots of spare capacity in parts of Asia. Uh, South America is in a difficult situation. Global growth is perhaps below what it otherwise should be. It's fragile. Um, and, and wages pressures aren't what they used to be. You know, when I started my career, wages would always bubble up when there was a bit of a recovery. This time we haven't seen that. So I think the environment we're going through, very different one. Um, the risks are still more skewed on the deflation side than the inflation side. And that partly explains why there's been several attempts by central banks, including our own and New Zealand's, over the last few years, they hike rates and then a few years later they're having to cut them back down again. Um, and so maybe the Fed might end up having to do the same at some point. So it's the inflation side of the story, which is still missing in action at the moment. David, could a raise in interest rates be a boon for confidence and give people, um, you know, spur the business community on to start investing and start taking a bit more activity? I don't know if it will spur business investment, but I think it will lift a, a major element of uncertainty in the equity market. Like I wouldn't be surprised if the Fed did raise rates and the market actually rallied just on just finally where this uncertainty that's been hanging over the market is removed. Um, just on the like just on the Fed and the inflation story, like I take Shane's point about core inflation and the US being only 1.2 percent. Um, I did a, po um, a piece a couple of weeks ago on our on our blog and surprisingly infl core US inflation over the past two decades has only averaged 1.7 and it's only been above 2 percent 25 percent of the time. So this, this idea that inflation is un, uncomfortably low and they've got to keep rates at zero, so to me seems crazy, because if you look at it, okay, it's a little bit below average, but it's not that much below. And I think people are maybe uh, are forgetting that US inflation has typically been low for the past couple of decades. And um, uh, it just doesn't seem to me a reason to, to be holding back, you know, raising interest rates from zero level when the unemployment rate arguably is already near full employment. Um, so, um, you, know, the, you know, getting back to the case for raising rates, I think, is, is incredibly strong. They should have gone a lot earlier than they've done to date. They've sort of painted themselves in a corner now um, to, to actually not go this week on the basis of some financial market volatility that happened a couple of weeks ago. Uh, seems to be crazy, but, um, you know, we'll wait and see. But um, as Shane was saying, I think it's inevitable they will be raising rates soon, but uh, I would have liked to have seen them go a lot earlier than they've, they've gone so far. And the, the focus globally uh, by many people on inflation, I think, has been completely misplaced. 
you've touched on it there, there being some volatility around um, some growth concerns and you know the, inf the inflation numbers. This period of volatility leading into the time that we're discussing right now, we've also seen major concerns surface around growth in China. Mm. Uh, if you're to balance your view about the importance of those two large economies, you've got the US economy and the Chinese mm -hmm. economy, where would you be focusing most of your attention? Look, I'm, I'm, I think the US economy is actually doing pretty well. I mean, there's a lot of momentum behind the economy. The housing sector is picking up and there's still a lot of potential. Uh, if you look at housing starts, they're still well below their long run average levels in the US. So there's a lot of scope for, for further pick up there. Business investment is the missing ingredient in a lot of economies. The US is no different. You know, Australia, we, we worry about our investment, but it seems to be a global phenomenon at the moment. Um, people aren't exactly sure why. In terms of China, I mean, you've got to unpack a lot of things in China. Sure, growth is slower than it was, but it's, it's, it's basically structurally slowing down anyway towards, say, 5 to 6% over the next five years anyway, just because it's becoming a bigger, richer economy. It's also, you know, as it, I think most people can see, it's rebalancing away from um, investment, industrial production. So those traditional indicators that we typically look at are probably giving us a, a, a not a great read on, on the economy. It's a, it's a skewed read and other areas like retail spending uh, are looking a lot better. So uh, the Chinese economy, you know, people worry about it. And I think, you know, because they focus on the share market, again, for I, I think the wrong reasons, the share market is a completely different beast. I think as Shane would agree. But um, I, I'm still pretty relaxed about the Chinese outlook and I'm, I'm super confident about the US outlook. Um, and um, you know the econ the global economy overall still seems to be in a pretty good good spot. Um, the the wobbles that we're seeing in some markets, Shane mentioned about how some central banks have raised interest rates, only to then have to unwind that. It's really been commodity exporting nations that have had that trouble. Um, and when you think about it, commodity exports commodity prices globally are weak. Uh, but in large part, it's because of supply. It's not because of you know demand is softer, but it's really a supply story. Um, which from the global perspective is actually quite a positive story. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty confident, uh, you know, comfortable with the global outlook and the share market outlook. Shane, I'm going to touch on the, on the yuan very briefly. Mm. Devaluation of that currency, is it justified given when you look at a basket of other currencies from the region, the yuan still looks relatively overvalued or hasn't depreciated anywhere mm. near as much as they have. Are, are mm. the Chinese justified to want to see their currency fall a bit further? Well, I, I think so. That, 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 that was really much ado about nothing. Um, when you think about the fact that the, uh, the Chinese currency is only off about 2% from where it was before they made the move, 2 mm. or 3%. So that's hardly a big move. And it is up a hell of a long way from where it was 10 years ago, 20 years ago. Mm. Um, and so I think logically the Chinese have realised, partly when the IMS said we want to see a bit more flexibility in new currency, they also realised that they'd tied themselves to a currency which was going up um, mm. but because of a strengthening economy and the prospect of higher interest rates, either the US, so they wanted to, to, to break that link. And I think mm. they've been very surprised by the reaction um, mm. to their announcement, which was a month or so ago now. Um, but I, I think at the end of the day, we just have to get used to the fact that the Chinese are gradually moving towards a more flexible exchange rate. Mm. Um, and that's, that uh, the timing created a bit of uncertainty, but I don't think it's a, a terminal problem. Um, I agree with David. The, the issues in China, are, I think, are a lot more manageable than some people um, seem to have it. Um, yes, it's going through a natural slowdown as it becomes a wealthier, richer country. Richer countries tend to grow slower um, than, than uh, poorer countries. Um, and I think if anyone has the wherewithal to support their growth, it's the Chinese. Yeah. Um, and so I think a lot of the reaction recently, partly on the back of their exchange rate move, creating uncertainty, yeah. partly on the back of their falling uh, share market, which I think is almost ridiculous, the way the world's suddenly fascinated <laughs> with the Chinese share market, but totally ignored it on the way up. I mean, no <laughs> one was exactly saying that the world was, China was going to boom uh, when the Chinese share market rose 150% over 12 months to June this year, I mean, it was totally ignored, but now there's a complete fascination with it. So I think a lot of the, the developments coming out of China have been blown out of proportion completely. Well, let's talk about the domestic share market and the domestic economy. We've just mm. come through um, the August reporting period where we get a, an update on how many of the businesses domestically are faring. Earnings for FY16 are going to be downgraded. Um, mm. Expectations have been um, downgraded. What was, you, what was your takeaway? Is the, has the the downturn from the commodity side of the economy overshadowed some bright spots or are we still facing well, a, a tough environment? 
I, I mean, the commodity downturn has certainly overshadowed uh, some good spots in the Australian economy. And I think we, we have, so, well, well, firstly, when we look at the headline number, profits were down 2%. The expectation uh, going into the reporting season was for about flat to maybe down 1%. So it's, it's slightly worse than expected. Mm. Most of the, all of the weakness was in fact in the resources side. Depending on how you add the numbers up, you get a number like minus 30%, minus 35% for resources profits. The rest of the market actually saw profit growth of around 8% or so. Um, and that's the fourth, fourth year in a row, fourth year in a row that the non-mining, non-resources part of the market has seen profit growth. And I think we sometimes forget that. The tough times in Sydney the tough times in the western suburbs of Sydney when it was paying the price for the mining boom in Western Australia, that was really four years ago. And the east coast of Australia, southeast um, Australia is actually picking up. So I think there's, a, there's reason to be optimistic there that um, with the Aussie dollar down, with interest costs down, with housing picking up and responding um, to lower interest rates like it did with retailing looking a little bit healthier and the big parts of Australia where the population lives looking healthier, um, I think all those things are, are pretty positive and so investors shouldn't be as negative as they have been on the Australian share market. Just on the, on, on the currency, does the currency need to move lower from where it is to, to keep things moving along or do we need another rate cut? I, I think we need, still need a little bit of help. So on, on the one hand you could say, well we haven't had the collapse that lots of people keep warning us about, the recession hasn't happened. On the other hand we could do better. Um, and I know the Reserve Bank would like to get some more help from Canberra um, on fiscal, maybe fiscal or maybe economic reform, but it's difficult to know whether those things are going to happen or not. Um, but I do think we could do a lot better than 2% growth, and on that front, either the Reserve might have to cut again, probably cut again, or the Aussie dollar has to keep going a little bit lower. Um, and so I'm, I'm thinking it could get down towards 60 cents. And that would be a typical overshoot for the Aussie. It, it overshot arguably relative to um, so-called purchasing power parity levels overshot to $1.10. Now it sailed through those levels on its way down to, to 60. Not in a straight line, of course. Mm. Um, but I think that that extra help will come, and we shouldn't get overly negative about it. I know it's going to cost more for you and I and whoever and David to go off to Disneyland for a holiday, but uh, that's just the way the economy works. You know, the lower Australian dollar is a great thing um, in terms of helping Australian industry through this through this tougher time. Sure. David, you. Glass half full or glass half empty on the prospect for the Australian economy? Uh, I'd have to say glass half empty. Um, like the, the economy, I think, is going to continue to struggle two to two and a half percent growth. Um, one of the things I worry about going forward is the mining. The mining downturn we all know about is still ongoing. There's very little sign of a transition to non-mining investment. The the survey is still showing pretty weak outlook there. And uh, I think something that's not on the radar yet that will emerge over the next three to six months is a housing uh, peak and a downturn. If you look at building approvals, they're at pretty high levels historically. You only need approvals to level out at a high level where the, so, such that the contribution to growth from housing construction falls away to zero. And it's been about, um, uh, you know, about a third of the contribution to growth over the last couple of years. So, People talk about housing approvals being at high levels. Well, that's not enough. They actually need to keep rising to contribute to growth. And in fact, I think they're going to peak out and, and probably start to fall away. We've, um, we've, um, you know, we've, we, we're cracking down on investor lending. All property investors around the country, myself included, I'm not sure about you, Shane, but we've had an interest rate increase. My bank has raised interest rates on my investment loans. And people, you know, anecdotally can't get loans for investment property as easy as they used to. And that was the big driver of our market. And I think that's going to uh, have an impact going forward. Consumer spending is still subdued. Income growth is still uh, weak. Um, the big thing about the economy that surprised this year is the unemployment rate hasn't gone up. And it were, had it gone up, um, the RBA would have cut rates further as, as I thought they would. Um, but I think if, with the growth still likely to be around 2 to 2.5%, it's inevitable that that unemployment rate will, will move higher, which in turn will put pressure on the Reserve Bank to do more, certainly as the housing sector starts to peak out. So that would be my outlook. And the Aussie dollar weakening, uh, I agree with Shane that it's, it's got to go lower. Uh, and I've had a, a call for 68 cents by year end for pretty much most of this year. It's and not I, looking bad at the moment. Yes, and I, and I think... Uh, and yeah, and by next year, something like 65 cents. And um, I think also you just got to remember, we're used to the currency around 80, 90, one dollar. The in real, uh, the long run average is uh, something like 72 cents against the US. And in real terms, if you're for inflation differentials between Australia and the United States, it's about 66 cents. So uh, it's certainly not 
cheap even at today's levels. Um, Shane touched on it, uh, the, the coordination between uh, Canberra mm. and the RBA. We've just had a change mm. of Prime Minister. Yep. A meaningful catalyst or a newspaper headline? Look, I think we'll see at least a short-term uh, uh, move higher in business confidence. I don't know, I'm sure about consumer confidence. But certainly business think they have the Prime Minister they need to push through uh, economic reforms. Now, he's going to face a lot of challenges and that he's going to be more consultative, as he said, with his Cabinet. And, uh, you know, there's a divided range of opinion in Cabinet as to what should be done. Then he has to face the Senate. So I think if Malcolm Turnbull per se were like running the country and what he wanted to do was what got done, I think it would be quite positive because a lot of his views are quite, quite good. But whether he can get everything through that he wants to do in areas of tax reform particularly uh, remains to be seen. But, uh, uh, but it's certainly we're in a better position, I think we were, um, in all fairness um, to, to Tony Abbott, you know, there was great despondency because he just wasn't interested in, in pushing through any reform, whereas at least the new Prime Minister seems to say he wants to do it. So, uh, yeah. Shane, I'll, I'll put the same question to you. Was uh, a, a positive development in Canberra or, uh, or just, just a headline for the short term? Well, it's certainly a headline, but um, I think it was a positive development. Uh, if you look at uh, confidence levels in Australia, they have been lacking. It seems for the last five years we've had accident after accident coming out of Canberra um, on both sides of politics. Um, I, I guess m my feeling about uh, Malcolm Turnbull is that he is someone who understands the economy and understands mm. business and understands you have to get those right mm. if you're going to maximise the welfare of the Australian people, whether it be employment or whether it be wages. Mm. Um, and I think he's also someone who articulates the problems Australia faces very well. If you, if you just watch Q&A, sometimes Q&A mm -hmm. is a rather depressing uh, watch on a Monday night, but um, <laughs> whenever he's been there, I, I get kind of the impression that he's leveling, leveling with us. and. Um, is prepared to do what he said he would do um, the other night when he, uh, he won the Prime Ministership, and that is articulate the problems, articulate some solutions, and try and uh, um, hopefully work on compromises with the Senate to get them through. So yeah, I'm pretty heartened by that move, um, and I'm hopeful that uh, the accidents coming out of Canberra quieten down and that uh, we, we can get on focusing about the reforms Australia needs. So just, just, uh, just on, like I think in terms of Canberra, there's two issues. One is longer term structural reform, uh, taxation reform and what have you, which is one issue. And the other one is like fiscal stimulus. Like I think when we talk about the switch between monetary policy and fiscal policy, it's that government, can government contribute to, um, to the stimulus that the economy probably needs? Um, and, and Unfortunately, at the moment, given the budget situation, I don't think he's going to be able to give a, give a lot. So I can't see a, although arguably there is a strong case to be made that we, we should have a, a um, you know, a government package of spending measures, you know, a short term boost to the economy. Um, I don't think they have the, uh, the fisc fiscal flexibility to do that. Um, so in that way, it's probably going to be disappointing. We're not going to get that rebalancing in terms of the growth, the, the policy levers that, that one might hope. Okay. Before we wrap things up, I'm going to put you each on the spot. We've talked about some of the front page headlines, such as the Fed and, and, mm. and uh, reporting season here in Australia. What's a, a second page headline that you, when you look at the, the world, that you think could be we could be talking about in three or six months' time that's not on everyone's radar at the moment? Uh, th th there's always, I mean, this is the thing, as an investor, you, you, it's just constant things to worry about. I mean, after we get over the Fed... It could be a good, be a good <laughs> well, I know, but after that, that we'll, we'll be worrying about the US government and whether they'll get funding for their budget and whether there'll be another government shutdown or not and, and the, uh, the debt ceiling, which they hit later this year. So that, I'm sure that's going to hit the headlines, but I think by year end, um, we'll be back to thinking, well, the global economy is continuing to grow. It's not fantastic. It's still uneven, but it's still, it's still growing. And I think optimism will start to return to investment markets as we come into year end. And in a way, it's not bad having these occasional setbacks, you know, whether it be bad weather in America or Greece or um, worries about China, because it stops things from overheating. I mean, David and I have spent most of our careers um, seeing cycles go up, things overheat. Next thing you know, the central banks are slamming the brakes on and we're going back down the other side. Um, the longer we can prevent that from occurring, um, the better, because the global economy will be a more elongated and a longer one, which ultimately should be a positive one for investors. David, something on the second page from you? Uh, well, two things spring to mind. Firstly, globally, I think US corporate profits, um, the global, you know, US corporate profit share is still historically high. 
Um, there's, um, you know, a it's just an argument how long that can go. I mean, it's been an amazing run for US corporate profits for a number of years, which has really been underpinning their market. And I, I just, you know, worry about, you know, maybe that will start to level out. Um, the other, domestically, the one I already mentioned is the housing sector. I think we've, we've basically almost taken it for granted that housing is strong because of low interest rates and almost become complacent about it, so much so that, you know, the Reserve Bank and APRA have been, um, you know, uh, attacking investors, property investors, which has been the, you know, we, we risk basically, you know, killing the goose, laying the golden eggs for the economy at the moment, and, and that's something I worry about down the track. Okay, great. Well, we're going to wrap it up there, folks. I hope you've enjoyed the discussion. Wide range of themes from offshore to domestically. I don't think there's too much for people to get worried about, but, uh, but keep an eye on the papers.